With the final season of Game of Thrones here, and the undead horde at the gates of Winterfell, it seems more and more likely that the Night King won't be making it to the end of the series, as well as many other beloved characters. I mean, unless he wins, and the final three episodes are just our favourites wandering around as whites, and maybe going for Cersei, but I doubt that. Personally, I think it might be a mistake to wrap this storyline up so early into the final season. Sure, Westeros' political turmoil has always been the most interesting aspect of the show, but considering we were introduced to the world of Ice and Fire, on screen at least, with the White Walkers, and much of the mystery of the show surrounded them, it would make sense to round the series off with a resolution to that same story. And by that I mean other supernatural and magical elements of the show too, not just the other's story. My guess is Game of Thrones will end with both the figurative and literal debt of magic, the price you pay for going up against the Night King, a reluctant king forced to take the throne, and a return to the status quo. Now, that might sound like a happy enough ending, but only if you've never actually watched an episode of Game of Thrones. The series has essentially been about the rebirth of magic in Westeros, and it going unnoticed because the Seven Kingdoms were too busy fighting amongst themselves. This is what allows the Night King to build his army of the dead, and it isn't until the 11th hour that the Grey Houses come together to fight a common enemy. Defeating the Night King and his army doesn't signal an end to conflict, just a return to fighting among one another. Even with Cersei out of the picture, how long before another War of the Five Kings? It's interesting to me that as magic becomes a bigger part of Westeros once again, we actually see less death, or at least less death at the hand of man. In the world of Game of Thrones, humans seem to do a lot better when there's magic around. This of course makes sense. In this world, the different gods are all in some way responsible for all this magic, and seeing evidence of a god is probably going to make you want to be a better person. It's no wonder then, that the period when magic was at its height, maesters refer to as the Age of Heroes. But with the Children of the Forest seemingly gone, the dragons likely to die in the upcoming battle, and Bran possibly having to sacrifice himself to help defeat the Night King, we may see magic recede into legend once more no matter how good of a job Sam Tarly does documenting it. That is, if he survives down in those crypts. Seriously, am I the only one who got anxious every time somebody said, you'll be safe in the crypts? They realise they're fighting a ice wizard who can raise the dead at will, right? Anyway, in my mind, any ending that doesn't explicitly abolish feudalism and sees magic fade away once more is an unhappy one. No matter who has to die to achieve it, yes, even Tyrion, the formation of a republic is probably the only hope Westeros has. Anything else is just more of the same. But to get to that stage, we must first get rid of the Night King. Who, for the purpose of this video, we will take Bran's word for it, even if I think there's more to his motivation, and assume the Night King isn't coming south to spread democracy, because that would really complicate matters. But you know, he very well could be. As it stands, we know little about the Night King and his plans for Westeros. Game of Thrones doesn't typically deal in simple models of good and evil, so why should it be any different now? And the villain of one side is always the hero of the other. The book and series give us so much backstory and world building of Westerosi lore, the fact that we get so little in regards to the White Walkers makes me feel that we're being manipulated to see them as a big bad that they may not be. This idea of creating an other is a common practice of propaganda during war times. We're vestiges of righteousness. The other is dangerous, sick, and crazy. This could be what George R. R. Martin is trying to do with these mysterious creatures from the lands of always winter. After all, in the novels, the White Walkers are even known as the others. Is it possible that the Night King too just wants to break the wheel? Sure, he'd make for quite the merciless revolutionary, but is the mother of dragons any better? Jakaris. I mean, if we look at the story from another angle, the Night King is a victim. 
Thousands of years ago, he was a man held prisoner by the children of the forest, tied to a tree and stabbed through the heart with a magical dagger that took away both his humanity and his freedom. All so he could be used as a soldier against his own people in the children's war with the first men. Now, the first men were an invading force and certainly not the good guys, but it's easy to see why a POW that was magically transformed into the children's version of a Manchurian candidate would eventually turn on them too. In the TV show, this is what led to a peace treaty between the children of the forest and the first men, known as the Pact. Seeing the White Walkers as a threat to boat races, one seemingly driven by the worst aspects of boat, they put their differences aside to fight the Horde. At the same time, the Night King had a different view on the same problem. He saw how the different races clearly couldn't live together in peace and harmony, so he set out to change that, to bring equality to Westeros and the rest of the world by bringing the Forever Night, turning the entire population into one united, blue-eyed race. Actually, wait. Yeah, no, he's probably the bad guy. Let's kill him. So, how do we go about it? As has been revealed in the series, there are two known ways to kill a White Walker. Dragonglass and Valyrian Steel. While fire is enough to stop a white, it has no effect on their creators, who in fact possess strong enough magic to extinguish the flames. I'd venture to guess that even Dragon's Fire doesn't have the effect on the White Walkers we once assumed it would. This is based on their complete lack of concern at the three fire-breeding dragons Daenerys brought north of the Wall. Now, Bran did say nobody ever tried, so it is possible that they just don't know their limitations, but all the same, we can't really rely on it. There are a couple of prophecies that give us clues to how the Army of the Dead can be defeated too. The main one being the uh, second coming of Azor Ahai, or the prince who was promised. But if we've learned anything from our time in Westeros, it's the prophecies are about as trustworthy as Peter Baelish, and left open to far too much interpretation to put any sort of faith in. I mean, this prophecy says the prince will awake a dragon from stone. This, of course, could refer to when Daenerys awoke her tree dragons from eggs that had turned to stone, or, you know, it could refer to the Night King himself, who awoke a dragon who had, presumably, frozen solid in the lakes beyond the wall. And okay, it's a bit of a stretch to say a frozen dragon is the same as one trapped in stone, but Melisandre taught Stannis to be the prince based on far more contrived readings of the prophecy, so why not? Hell, Sir Davos is a better candidate considering he too technically awoke a dragon from stone. The prophecy also states that the prince will unite Westeros, and sure, the Night King wants to unite the entire continent as one undead hive mind, but it'd be a united land nonetheless. I'm not saying the Night King is the prince who was promised, obviously. I'm just saying... Prophecies are dangerous things. So let's try something else. Perhaps the Night King needn't be killed. Maybe the pacifist in you thinks Westeros has seen enough bloodshed and you would prefer a peaceful resolution. Well, it's not as crazy as it sounds. The Night King could be open to negotiations. We know this from the deal he made with the wilding Craster who offered up his infant sons to the White Walkers in return for guaranteeing the safety of he and his daughters slash brides. That never sounds right. Now, Jon Snow struggled to convince the Night's Watch to even accept the wildlings, so good luck trying to pitch this plan to them. But it at least shows that the White Walkers are capable of negotiating some kind of deal. This is probably not so much the case in the TV show now, going by what Bran has told us about the Night King and his motivation, but... I find it hard to believe that an army capable of bringing their deceased opponents back to life to join their own ranks could have ever been beaten by sheer force and just retreat. So it's entirely possible that in the days of Azor Ahai, a deal was made with the White Walkers. I mean, I understand retreating to regroup, but to wait 8,000 years? We can't really negotiate with the White Walkers when we don't know for sure that he even has an ulterior motive. Prior to last week's episode, I thought for certain there was one. Revenge certainly seemed to be driving the Night King in some sense. For six seasons, people were asking what was taking so long for the White Walkers to move beyond the Wall. Well, 
it was probably no accident that the Night King only really turned his focus towards the south once he took care of business up north, killing Leaf and the Children of the Forest, his original creators, and the Tree-Eyed Raven. It was then that he really started to build his army up, taking control of a dragon and Mark and Bran were obviously integral parts of his plan, but his personal vendettas seemed to tell us something more. But apparently that wasn't the case after all. Originally, this led me to believe that now that he'd got his revenge, he wanted to finally rest, and his move south was actually to find a replacement to lead his people, someone of noble blood perhaps. While White Walkers seemingly need to be created at infancy, the Night King was an adult when he himself was created, so it's possible he could intend to pass on his own rank to an unsuspecting foe with a similar ritual. Now, this seems less and less likely after last week's episode and the reveal of his ultimate goal, but all the same, now that we know the final face-off with Bran, John, and the Night King is going to take place in a godswood where he was created, maybe. But these are all just guesses. The only things we know that can defeat a White Walker for certain are Dragon's Glass and Valyrian Steel, but not so fast. Yes, we've seen these take down White Walkers before, but does that necessarily mean they'll have any effect on Big Daddy Ice himself? The danger in assuming that the same rules applies to all these creatures has already been pointed out by Jon Snow in the series. We know for a fact that the Night King has different powers than the other White Walkers. They can all raise the dead and create whites, but only he can transform infants into White Walkers. So it stands to reason that with stronger magic, he may not have the same weaknesses. I would be willing to bet that we'll see a scene this season where Jon Snow has the Night King cornered and will go for the killing blow only for Longclaw to shatter upon impact. But that's okay, because I think I've figured it out. The others, while unique to Game of Thrones, bear many similarities to other creatures from works of fantasy. Whites, for example, aren't inventions of George R. R. Martin and have been staples of the fantasy genre since Greta's saga. The White Walkers are more of an original creation, but still we can look to some of the more popular creatures of fantasy to gain some clues as to how to defeat them, specifically the Vampire. Like we find in many versions of vampire lore, the White Walkers use the Sire approach. In simple terms, this means that the being who transformed or sired, the vampire, or in this case, white, is also the source of its power. So if you kill the sire, you kill all those he sired. And similar to vampire lore, there's different levels here, and a sired being is only capable of creating a lesser creature. Like how the Night King can create white walkers, but they can only create whites. A common vampire rule is that lesser vampires can be taken care of individually with, say, holy water, silver, or fire. But to end it all, you'll need to take out their master, which requires considerably more effort. Only achievable by a beheading or the more popular method of driving a wooden stake through their heart while they sleep. I think that a similar rule must then apply to the Night King. I don't think you have to drive a wooden stake through his heart. I think you remove one. And by wooden stake, I mean magic-infused dragon's glass. It was this obsidian stone that gave birth to the Night King, and so it stands to reason that it may be the source of his power too. Now, the White Walker's weapons will shatter a regular blade, and the Night King's touch alone was enough to mark Bran, even while he was plugged into the weirwood. So we can assume that getting too close to him in real life is probably going to result in a quick but insignificant death. So we'll have to work together for this one. Lucky for us, that same little weird cripple boy may be a good distraction tool. While it's not clear if Bran is powerful enough to warg into the Night King, they have met while plugged into the weirwood. We can also assume that the Night King's physical body is in the same state while connected as we've seen others be, and therefore vulnerable. If Bran can lure the Night King into a mental battle, it could give Jon, for example, or more preferably Jamie, enough time to remove the Dragonstone and end it all. And like I said, 
their face off is going to end up in the gods would so it is possible but from the looks of things unlikely it's pretty obvious now that this isn't where the show is going but if you find yourself going up against the night king in real life it just might be worth a try or you know you could just stay your side of the wall and maybe this whole war won't kick off to begin with